Um, I want to welcome everybody back this Monday night. Thank you for being here. Um, we are going to be talking about some long-term care tonight, but before we do, just want to open again with a brief, a brief devotion. Um, one of the things that is really important as we care for our loved ones is just being present, um, being there with them and being a caring presence and letting them know that you are there. Um, there is this little book, it's called The Art of Being a Healing Presence, and it says, what is a healing presence? A healing presence is the condition of being consciously and compassionately in, in the present moment with the other person, believing in and affirming their potential for wholeness wherever they are in life. Um, it says, healing presence requires a certain amount of time, yet it affects may be evident very rapidly and perhaps immediately. It can take place while other things are going on. You can be a healing presence in many things that you do as a caregiver. Um, and I think of caring for my father-in-law for a few years when he was living with us, and I would get impatient because he moved so slowly. If I could turn back that time, I would just sit and be with him a little more than I did rather than we've got to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. So, you know, by being that slowed down, take a breath, healing presence to those that we're caring for, I think that that can be very healing and can be um, a sense of wholeness for that person to to realize their value. And even though they see themselves declining in health, that you being with them has some real value. Um, so I just encourage you to do that and, and encourage myself too as I say that. Um, let us have just a brief prayer. O oh Lord, you know not what we ought to ask of you. Only you know what we need. You know us better than we know ourselves. Father, give to your children what we ourselves do not know how to ask. Teach us to pray. Pray for yourself in us. Amen. We do thank you for being here. We especially thank Hillary Kaler. She and I tried to get together for several weeks, but the ice and the snow just forbid us for a while. Um, we talked on email for a good bit, um, but she is here. She is kind of an expert on long-term care. She knows the, the system. She worked for many years in care facilities and being a care manager in many different realms, um, and now she has been in 10 years on the um, area, I have to say this right, because I call it the Council on Aging, and that is not what it is anymore, is the Area Aging Agency on Aging, um, the AAA, which is not AAA, we were talking about, but the Area Agency on Aging, and she is going to talk to us some, and I'll turn this over to her, and we want to also thank Jim for um, recording these and getting these up online um, and setting up for us. We really do appreciate that, Jim. Thanks. Let's see if this works. I don't need two microphones. Can everybody hear me pretty good? Yay, it's working. I'm not the most technologically advanced person, so this is exciting for me. I really appreciate Susan having me here tonight. Um, I do a lot of different presentations, and I always try to tailor it to who I'm speaking to. Um, there is so much to know about long-term care choices, about the healthcare system, and I really, uh, it's so much information and it's kind of cramped into one hour, so I hope I'm clear. I hope I make sense. I absolutely want to answer your questions, so please feel free to ask as I go through. I may get to it in a little bit, um, but absolutely I want to be here and be the resource for you and answer the questions. That sounds better. I can hear myself better. Thank you so much. Um, as Susan said, I am Hillary Kaler. I am a regional ombudsman with the Area Agency on Aging. And so I work, um, actually, let me actually use my slides. It'll help you go along. Um, I work part of a regional organization and the Area Agency on Aging. The nice thing about it is it's in every state. So no matter where you travel, there's always an Area Agency on Aging. They may look a little bit different. Some states um, are smaller than others. Um, there's always an ombudsman program, which is, is one of the services that I, I actually directly provide here for our agency. 
And has anybody ever heard of an ombudsman? A couple folks have, okay, perfect. Um, an ombudsman is actually a person who works specifically with folks who live in long-term care facilities. And we promote and protect the rights of those residents in those facilities. We work a lot with families, we work a lot with the staff in those facilities to make sure that they're providing the best care that they can and that we resolve issues and concerns the best way that we can. Um, so some of the interesting stuff that we know. As of just a couple years ago, every day 10,000 people turned 65. That's amazing, right? What are those folks called? What population is that? Baby, Baby boomers. We knew they've been coming for a long time, right? We've done pretty good to prepare for them, but not perfect. Uh, there's a lot of choices. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, and the ma they always say that the magic number was 65 years old, but in the beginning when people were first thinking about retiring, the average life expectancy was a whole lot less than it was now. The average life expectancy in general for men and women is different, but on average it's about 79 years old. Um, many, many years ago when lots of the services that we now rely on, the average life expectancy might have been 55 for people. So some of the services are very, very different. Um, the people are living and their healthier lives longer. I have to put my Wizard of Oz in here. I love my Wizard of Oz. What do people mostly say when it comes to long-term care choices? Don't you dare put me in a nursing home, right? How many folks have heard that from their family? A lot of people, absolutely. My mother tells me that. Mary knows my mother. My mother would never do well in a nursing facility, she tells me. One thing I want to say about that, though, is home is not always the best place to be. It's not always the safest place to be. It might have been a home that's not in the best repair anymore. Maybe you've lived in that home 50 or 60 years. Maybe you're very isolated in your home and you need to get out and have more opportunities and more resources. So the wonderful thing about the world that we live in now is that you have a lot of choices, you have more opportunity than ever, and you also have a lot of opportunity to bring services into your home. So what I wanted to do was kind of give you a whole bunch of options about what's available in the community, all those resources in your home, and then if you're not able to be in your home, what options you might have as well. Okay, the long-term care continuum. Aging is a process, right? It starts at birth and ends with death. We can't do anything about it. Everybody's gonna age. We always use the phrase in our office, one of our um, ombudsmen that is my supervisor and mentor that I've known for years, always has said, you will age as well as you've lived. So I love that phrase. We do a lot of classes for folks in high school, in college, and when I say that to folks, they always say, well, what do you mean by that? I'm like, well, if you do a lot of risky stuff, if you have a motorcycle, if you smoke, if you drink, if you do things to excess, you will age as well as you've lived. You will live hard, you will age hard. And that's pretty much a proven fact. You can change at any given time, and I had one, one lady tell me that her, she's celebrating 41 years ago, you stopped smoking. Is that right? Did you tell me that when we first came in? Yeah. <laughs> she did. So you can change at any given time, change your behaviors, change the way you eat, change exercise patterns, all those things, so we can all do things a little bit better. Oh, look at my little guys moving. You gotta love that I do things and I don't remember I do them. That's why I have sticky notes all over my desk. Starting with the basics. The two basic questions that we ask, and at the area agency, a lot of the things that I do are very specific to long-term care service, but I would say about 50% of the folks that I talk to need to know what those options are. And the first two things that I always talk to people about, whether it's folks living in this area that are trying to make a choice about moving into maybe a retirement community, moving into a long-term care setting, trying to bring some help into their home. A lot of times I get calls from people who are, have been here for quite some time and they're moving their family down from Michigan or they're moving their family down from somewhere else and they wanna know what those options are. Um, I always ask, what do you know you need and how are you gonna pay for it? Those are the two most basic questions. You have to think about, do you have any medical needs? Are there any things that you know that you're going to need? Do you have transportation? You have to get to the doctor. Are you not driving anymore? That's going to be very different based on, on where you are in town. Um, are you on dialysis for some reason? Is there some specific issue that you have as far as how often you go to the doctor? Um, 
What are your social needs? Do you still volunteer? Do you do lots of things in the community? What's available to you? How are you going to pay for it? A lot of times people do very well to pay for things that they know that they can afford with private pay dollars. Um, a lot of times when you're in long-term care, you're going to use Medicare dollars for rehabilitation and therapy. We're going to talk about that uh, a little bit more. But navigating that system is what seems to every, for a, a sticking point for everybody. How do I go through this maze of all of these choices that I have? So hopefully I will lay these choices out for you a little bit better so that you can understand. Oh. The continuum of care. Okay. So you have independent options, people who are at home. Um, and at home, we're going to talk a little bit more about what those community-based services might be and things that are available to you, um, how you can be healthy and, and, active, and do some active aging. I, in the back, I forgot to mention this in the beginning, but I did put out probably more information than you care to have. I did do the entire PowerPoint, and I printed it out for you. I have a resource guide back there and a couple different little brochures. When we talk about active aging, how to stay healthy and well in your home. Uh, classes that are offered, senior centers and things like that that have options for you. Um, last year, our local Mecklenburg County senior centers were actually taken over by park and rec departments. So a lot of the senior centers have much more of a focus now and they're getting there to do more of health and wellness classes, keeping people active at any age, and a lot of people didn't really realize that. And so um, we had four senior centers in Mecklenburg County and with all of the park and rec influence, we have an opportunity to have 20 senior centers across the county if all the different park and rec departments took on some senior programs and active senior initiatives. So it's kind of exciting for us. Facility-based options. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about those. CCRCs, those are continuing care retirement communities. We have seven of those in Mecklenburg County. Um, those are your South Minsters and Sharon Towers and Plantation Estates and Cypress, all of those types of facilities. Please. It's, an, it's a nice, um, Susan was mentioning, um, she's got one document back there that actually has all of the different prices and all of the different pieces of information that all the retirement communities offer. And it's nice, it's a nice option for people. Um, and I actually think it's a better option nowadays than, than I might have used to have thought. Um, it really is. It's, um, we'll talk about some of the fees and things about why it's a better option for you, but it really is a continuum of care for a lot of folks. So you've got your facility-based information, your assisted livings, your nursing homes fall into that category. Um, that would also include maybe a hospice facility um, or a special care unit for folks that maybe have Alzheimer's or dementia. So those would all be facility-based. And of course, your acute care options, which are hospital and there are uh, freestanding rehabilitation centers as well. So some of the community-based services that I mentioned, um, those are all different services that are potentially free services to everyone in the county. There's not an income requirement for most of those services. Any community-based service that is provided um, sometimes has an age requirement. A lot of these programs might be for folks who are 60 and older, but there are also opportunities for folks who, um, an adult in the, in, the, um, in the world of aging and adult services, an adult is anyone over 18. So sometimes we work with a lot of folks who are an older adult, but they're 52 years old, but they've had a disability for years. So there's a lot of services based on your need, not always just based on your age as much as it used to be. So some of the different programs that are offered, and I just mention it because people don't always realize what's out there. Some of the nutrition programs that are out there, whether it's Meals on Wheels, which people might be familiar with, friendship trays, we have lovely options in Mecklenburg County, more than just one. Um, and actually, the Meals on Wheels program will bring a meal, they bring frozen meals to your home once a week, and they drop those meals off. So you don't have every day, some smaller counties do where they drop off a meal every day. Um, Friendship Trays does that, they drop off a meal every day. So it's a nice option for you, and somebody's checking in with you as well. There are also congregate meal sites. So some of those senior centers I mentioned have meal site programs. A lot of churches have participated in those meal site programs, and we hope that those expand um, with that park and rec as well. 
Um, the senior centers just in general are an option for lots of folks. Um, there are adult daycare programs. Um, Department of Social Services offers a lot of services uh, just to kind of get you information. And uh, one of the best resources that our county actually has is called Just One Call. Has anybody ever heard of Just One Call? Susan has, Marie has, absolutely. Just One Call was actually, I think, uh, maybe about 15 years old now. Uh, it was a program that came out of just basic information and assistance at the Department of Social Services. And you can call a number and they can give you lists of all the different agencies. Maybe you're looking for particular home health agencies. Uh, maybe you're lo looking to where the locations of the senior centers are. Um, maybe you're looking at some of the facilities that are out there. They can give you that information. But it's the main intake for all of the Department and Social Services offerings for some of their community-based service. Um, the Department of Social Services here in Mecklenburg also provides a family caregiver support program, and I brought some flyers about that as well, just to see what's offered for families, because um, as a family caregiver, those types of things affect people's work. Sometimes they call it having a sandwich generation. They're caring for their children, they're caring for their older adults, and they have lots of choices and things that they need to decide, um, and they need a lot of guidance. The easiest thing, I didn't put it in the PowerPoint, I apologize for that, but the easiest, it's the easiest number in the world to remember. Um, it's 704-432-1111. Count backwards from four and you can call the number. Um, but it's, uh, I think sometimes they do a, a lot of information and assistance, but it's also not as well known. Everywhere I go, I always mention it just in case. Okay. Senior housing options. So senior housing has kind of um, exploded in the past couple of years. You'll see a lot of uh, communities that are focused on folks who are 50 and older. Um, does anybody are familiar with like the Sun City options that are out there? The closest ones down right in South Carolina, the Dell Webb community. Um, I know, do you like my little U-Haul with the thing on the back? That's cute. You have to put fun pictures in PowerPoints because PowerPoints can be very boring. Um, but there are apartments out there. There are all different types of options. Um, the spectrum is huge. You have a lot of independent senior apartments. They're great because they provide transportation, they provide security, they might provide one meal a day, they might provide three. They're very, very different based on your options. Um, they have um, a lot of different options for people who are trying to build houses and have mother-in-law suites on their homes. Um, things that, that have come into uh, fashion more than there was many, many years ago. Um, there are uh, rent-based or income-based housing vouchers that are out there for folks who might, um, you know, have used all their assets for one reason or another. Um, I run into people all the time who have had huge hospital bills and they have gone through their savings like they never thought they would. They've had chemo treatments, they've had some type of treatment, they've sold their house never thinking that they would. Um, I actually had a couple that I talked to that sold their home for his wife's chemo treatments to pay the hospital and they were living in an extended stay hotel and they were in their late 80s. And I thought, oh my goodness, there, got to, there has to have been something better that could have been done. Um, they didn't have any children, they didn't have a lot of options, and they just did what they thought they had to do. So I talk to lots of different types of folks all the time, and we're always trying to find the best thing that can potentially try to help folks make good choices on the front end. Other things about senior housing, um, you do have to be independent, but I will say that a lot of the senior housing that's available in the community, they might have a, a home care service on site or they contract with a home care service so you can have someone come in and do extra things for you as well. So the options are huge, um, more than ever, and they have expanded on those service and offered supportive services more than ever. I mentioned this program because it's relatively new. It's only been in Mecklenburg County for about a year. Um, it is a program called PACE, which is a program for all-inclusive care of the elderly. And it is um, one of the very first, well, mainstream options for folks who maybe care for a loved one in the home, but they work and they have still promised mom or dad that they didn't want to have them go to a nursing home, but they need a lot of medical attention or they're a very frail diabetic or something's going on where they need a lot of particular care during the day. They can go five days a week, they could go two days a week. It is like an adult daycare program, but it's very all-inclusive. They look up 
um, your entire profile. There's a doctor on site. Um, they take over your medical care profile. Um, and it is expanding a little bit. It is still specific to zip codes, but they hope to service all of um, uh, the Charlotte and surrounding area right now. Pace of the Southern Piedmont is the one that's in our area, and there's a brand new one towards Gastonia, um, which is also just, just getting up and going. Um, that one's probably been around about six months. So we're the, about the seventh site in North Carolina for a PACE program, which is a really good option for some folks as well. Okay, retirement communities, and that's the sheet that Susan had uh, a lot of good prices on. Um, the continuum of care for retirement communities, I think, is huge. I actually started out my work as a social work in a retirement community years and years ago. Uh, I worked at the Methodist Home 20 years ago, and um, it's changed a whole lot over there. It looks real different, and it's a wonderful option. At one point, um, I would have thought there would have never been any way for anyone that I knew to ever go into a retirement community. Oh my goodness, it's going to cost so many dollars, and it just seems unreachable for a lot of folks out there. More and more, I see retirement communities as a very good option for folks. A long time ago, people used to maybe move into a retirement community at 60 or 65 years old. And I used to work with ladies who were 96, and they said, oh my gosh, I would have never moved in here if I thought I was going to live this long. I've gone through all my money. I've been here 35 years. Can you believe that? And I said, that's because you've had good health care. They fed you well. They provided a lot of good stuff to you. You've had a lot of enjoyment in your life. And that was part of the reason why you did so well. But as an option, it ends up being a better option for a lot of folks um, who maybe could sell their home, pay an entrance fee, and then some of those fees, you're in a, a continuum of care means that you're in a system where you normally never leave that system. You start an independent living, assisted living is there, nursing home is an option as well. Um, and so we'll talk about why that's a benefit when you look at the people delay some of those options and they might stay at home for a very long time and then they need to go right into assisted living or right into a nursing home. And sometimes they had said to you know, people that I've worked with a lot will say, you know, years ago I thought I should have moved into that retirement community and I probably should have when I was thinking about it. Um, just because when you pay, go directly into an assisted living or a nursing home and you're using private pay dollars, it's a huge expense. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. I'm almost there. Assisted living. Everybody knows what assisted living is, right? About the year 2000, they popped up on every street corner. They did. There was only about, let's see, back in 1999, there was about 14 assisted livings in Mecklenburg County that were choices for folks. And today there's 53 assisted livings in Mecklenburg County. Assisted living technically uh, provides you with more social needs than medical needs. It was set up to say, okay, if you need a little bit of assistance with getting dressed in the morning, or no, you get dressed just fine, you need assistance with showers, you don't want to take your medication anymore because your vision's not as good and I need someone really to help me make sure I'm taking the right things at the right time. Um, or it's just reminders of taking your medication. You still manage all your own medication. I shouldn't put that right there. I'm going to hit it about 10 times. You need assistance with bathing and those types of things. Your nursing care needs are much less than your social needs. You're not driving anymore, um, all those things. So that's where assisted living started. The things that have changed with assisted living, not only that they've expanded so much, they have kept people for all these years who are now very frail. And so they have stayed in this assisted living because they got used to it. Uh, and they weren't maybe necessarily set up to take care of all those medical needs. What I will always say blanketly, and I have many a friend in assisted living, so I don't mean it to sound negative, but assisted livings, again, were set up with a model where you don't have as much professional staff in assisted living. They are not required to have a registered nurse on site all the time. They're not even required to have a registered nurse eight hours a day. They could have one a week that checks on everybody else's information. You do not have nurses that pass medications. They're passed in a bubble pack that a, a CNA who's been trained and tested through a med tech program can pass this bubble pack medication to you. Now in saying that, that's what the standard is. Some assisted livings go way above and beyond that. They do have nurses 24 hours a day. But I always, it's one of those buyer beware kind of things. Really ask those questions when you're looking at assisted livings because they are not all created equal. They are very, very different. And they're very, very based in contracts, 
When you first go in, they'll give you more paperwork than you care to look at, but make sure you look at it. Make sure you have a copy of it because there's lots of fine print. Um, assisted living in North Carolina, it's pretty much the same in every state, um, but the, the way it's regulated as far as when you talk about long-term care, assisted living is regulated by the state. So it is licensed by the Division of Health Service Regulation. Ooh, I even have a little pointer on here. Look at that. Figure out how to use it. Little things just excite me. So the Division of Health Service Regulation, um, there is a star rating system, and the star rating system is based on just like the child care system is. How many stars you have means that's how well you did on that most recent survey. So it's really, really good information to have. Um, Multi-unit housing with services, the piece at the top, those are not licensed facilities, but they actually do provide what they call personal care service. In general, personal care services mean I remind you of things, but I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you to provide care. I'm just telling you what you need to do. Um, I, one example would be the Lodge at Bryan Center. Another example would be certain areas of Marywood have a personal care unit. They're not a licensed assisted living. They have a personal care unit. And then they have the independent living as well. One piece that I like to mention, oh, wait a minute, I have to go back. Oh, wait, what did I do? I got too excited there, didn't I? I shouldn't be allowed to have a clicker. Okay, family care homes. I mentioned family care homes because that's an option for folks that people don't really know about. Been around for a very, very long time, but people don't always realize it's an option for them. They are small, assisted living communities and they have five or six people at the most. Um, some only have four, and that care is set up in a home-like setting, and we have, right now, Mecklenburg County has about 19 family care homes, and people don't realize that's an option for you. Um, I think it's a great option in a lot of ways because people don't like the large assisted living. It depends on somebody's personality and what they like, but family care homes offer a lot of different options for people. Um, some are private pay dollars only. Some do accept what we'll talk about with Medicaid and special assistance at times, but they are a very good, very reasonable option. Um, there's not as much overhead, so it's a much more small setting. Uh, privately owned, corporations do not own any of our family care homes. They are owned privately for the most part. So that makes a little bit more uh, a difference for folks. And there's some uh, brand new um, family care homes that were built in Mint Hill last year. Uh, we have one uh, provider in this county that started with one or two homes and he's now up to five family care homes. Um, it's something that he really enjoys doing and he wants to bring more to the area. So uh, we're always excited to see what kind of family care home option he'll have. Nursing homes, okay. Most everybody is very familiar with what nursing homes can do. But nursing homes have changed. Um, many, many years ago, it's the only setting in long-term care that is considered institutional care. So assisted living care is actually called community-based living. It's still your house, it's still housing. But nursing homes are actually institutional care. Um, skilled nursing care, nursing facility care, it's all the same type of thing. Hospitals do not keep people anymore, do they? Do you remember when people used to go to the hospital and they might have a stroke and they stayed there for three months? Do you remember that? My grandmother did when I was little. A lot of folks did. Three days, 3.2 days, they want you out of that building, don't they? You have to choose an option. Can you go home? Are you well enough to go home? Maybe you can go home with home health. That's fabulous. If not, I think I'm going to have to have my therapy at a nursing home. The funniest call I get, usually on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, when the hospitals are trying to have folks make a choice and they're pressuring families to make a choice, they'll say, I need to go to a rehab facility for my loved one, and they gave me a list of nursing homes. And I'll say, uh-huh, that's a rehab facility. Are you kidding? I can't have my mom go into a nursing home. I'm like, well, that's where the rehab is done. There's a couple rehab facilities, but nursing homes provide 90% of the rehab that's done. So it's kind of amazing. Um, the nursing facility care is based on 24-hour need for nursing care, rehabilitation, physical therapy of any kind, or occupational therapy. Um, they at least need to have eight hours a day to have a professional nurse monitor them. Folks in nursing facilities are more chronically ill, acutely ill than ever before. 
um, about, I think they say the average is that between five to 10% of the population will live long-term care in a nursing home for the rest of their life. And about up to 20% of the population may live in a nursing home for six to eight weeks to receive therapy. So it's a very different environment there. Uh, the one thing that I didn't mention, I'll go back just for a second, with assisted livings, one thing that I wanna mention is that there is an age, they can, they can self-implement an age requirement. So assisted livings could say, again, adults are 18 and older, so they could take anyone 18 and older, all the way to 104, or we could be a facility that chooses to take people 55 and older, or 60 and older. So just be aware of that sometimes when you're looking at assisted living. Nursing homes cannot do that. They take anybody 18 and older. And I'll be very honest with you, the interesting part of nursing homes a lot, and I spend most of my time in nursing homes, is that I work with 27-year-olds and 34-year-olds and 45-year-olds all the time. They might live alone. They may not have any family around. They've had a stroke. They've had a car accident. And they had to go to a nursing home for rehab. So it's really amazing to me how things have changed over time. But you do see all ages in nursing homes. And sometimes... Um, for folks that are not as familiar with the healthcare system, when they go in and see that, they have no idea why that's happening. But all those options are out there for everybody. There's a lot of opportunity now in nursing homes. If you have been in a facility for a very long time and you wanna move back into the community, there's a lot of community initiatives to move folks back out into the community and live in an apartment um, and utilize some services and try to be as independent as possible, especially with some of the young, younger folks that have gone into a facility, say for, traumatic brain injury or an accident or a stroke, because um, that takes a lot longer to rehab from. Okay. Special care units. Special care units are the option, whether it be in an adult care home or a nursing facility for folks who have any, kind, any type of confusion, um, dementia, Alzheimer's, anything that would be symptomatic like that. Um, I would tell you that there used to be many nursing homes that had a specific area of the nursing home that had a locked area. There's only one out of all 28 nursing homes in Mecklenburg County that has a locked unit anymore. They just don't do it anymore. Um, assisted livings, much more so. Usually folks that have any kind of confusion or dementia usually um, are much more physically able and active and they're um, not as medically inclined to, to need skilled nursing or a professional nurse. They just need structure and they need reminders and they need a secure environment. So assisted livings really kind of took over that uh, niche and have um, had many more options for special care units. I will say with the baby boomers coming in and with Alzheimer's being a very prevalent thing now that we're living our, our healthier lives longer, uh, we absolutely don't have enough resources for people who have dementia. And a lot of times when I talk to folks who might be looking at options, I will actually have to tell them to go out of county for placement. There might be one in Gastonia, there might be one in Cabarrus, there might be one in Union County to look at, and there's one here. And families are always shocked about that. And I, I hate that there's not better resources, but that's um, just what has happened recent, in, in many more recent years. If it's skilled nursing that they need, if it's assisted living, then there are options. Okay. Private pay dollars. Of course, we can always use private pay dollars to pay for care. Um, there are options for um, folks when they're, say they're utilizing um, a long-term care insurance policy. Um, many, many years ago, we didn't see many of those. Now that's much more common. Um, when you have private pay dollars, it does mean that there's a lot more choice for you at times. Um, you're not looked at any differently. The facilities don't know who is paying for what private pay or who's paying for what on, on any kind of special assistance. Um, but the options uh, just give you a little bit more options, especially in assisted living. Not as many assisted livings take um, Medicaid or special assistance. They all take private pay dollars. So there's a little bit more option that way. And that's the same for any kind of home care that you would have. Um, when you're looking at um, skilled home care, usually they're in there doing your, your physical therapy and your occupational therapy, but there are many, many non-medical home providers that are out there that are able to come in your home um, one day a week in two-hour increments. Um, they might 
uh, come almost every day and provide a little bit of help and assistance around the house. And those all vary, and, and you can pay for those services by hour. Um, there are programs, I'll actually have a slide on some of the programs that you can do for folks that have um, lower income, but um, the non-medical home care really has taken off. I'd probably say since about 2000, 2005, we've really seen a huge increase in that. Insurance options. So you've got Affordable Care Act, which everyone calls Obamacare, right? Medicare um, as the most noted insurance policy that we have in any type of long-term care insurance. So we're gonna talk about those specifically. Medicare. Original Medicare is not free. That's true. A lot of people get very confused with that. Um, they'll go into the hospital, they'll have a loved one who has had um, a crisis of some kind, and they'll say, I need to go into the nursing home and I can have Medicare pay for up to 100 days. That's what they hear. Medicare only pays for 20 days in a nursing home. They can pay up to 100 days, but only at 80%. So that means 20% is on you whether it's your pension, your social security, any kind of income. So that makes a little bit of a difference for folks uh, when they're looking at that rehabilitation in a facility. Um, Medicare is a great insurance policy. Uh, it um, has options for Part A, B, and D. A lot of the plans for Part D, um, they have different deductibles and different co-payments, but some of those plans um, really give folks options, and I, we always encourage people every year when there's open enrollment for some of those Medicare D plans, when you're looking at your um, pharmaceutical needs, and those things do change every October, I think it's October 15th to December 7th, you have an option every year and things do change, and we really encourage people to look at those plans. See if the plan is still covering the medications that you're on. Make sure something hasn't changed, because the companies always wheel and deal and change sometimes the medications that they will cover. Um, you have different part uh, advantage plans. I think advantage plans are a great option for some folks because the premiums may be a lot less, but the, uh, again, the beware about an advantage plan. My great grandmother has an advantage plan and when she went into, she had a car accident and broke her foot and she had to have um, rehabilitation and she knew the nursing home that she wanted to go to in Gastonia where she lives and they did not accept Medicare Advantage plans. They accept Medicare A, but they would not accept a Medicare Advantage plan. So my great grandmother, who's 91 years old, said, well, I'm not going anywhere then, going home. So the family helped take care of her and we had a home health. Um, made it a whole lot harder, um, but we actually did do that. So just, it's a good option for a lot of folks, but ask a lot of questions. Um, I have some numbers um, more towards the end of my slides that I can show you about who you can ask Medicare Advantage plans questions. Has anyone ever heard of SHIP counselors? SHIP counselors? Absolutely. Yeah, oh, perfect. That's wonderful. They are such a wealth of information, and we encourage people to talk to SHIP counselors all the time. We have three at our office. Um, and um, they constantly have questions. So, uh, and we refer people to Shepherd Center and we refer people to the senior centers anytime we know anyone. So that's a wonderful service. Um, public benefits, Medicaid. Medicaid, uh, a lot of times, I think the biggest piece that people need to understand about Medicaid is people sometimes think they'll never qualify. It's always worth looking into. Um, I actually brought a sheet, one of the sheets that I have up in the front it's a little tip sheet, it's one page, and it talks about if you ever are thinking of applying for Medicaid, what you would need to bring. Um, and a lot of times I think people, again, they don't think that they're gonna qualify. Medicaid is broken down into several different areas. You can have Medicaid if you live in your home, and it's always based on your assets, and it's based on what you bring in monthly. You can have Medicaid and assisted living, which is called special assistance Medicaid and you can have Medicaid in a nursing home. All of them have different requirements. Um, when you're in the nursing home, it's the highest threshold of requirement because it's the highest level of skill service that's available. A lot of folks qualify for Medicaid in nursing homes without a problem, absolutely. Um, it's not automatic, you have to apply and qualify. It's not guaranteed, you do have to meet certain criteria, 
but only you have to go to the Department of Social Services to apply for Medicaid, and lots of people, even me, can give you all kinds of good information, but you have to go there because everything, even the best information that I have, I would not be the person to determine your eligibility, only they would. And it's worth it sometimes. There's a lot of folks, like I said, who have outlived a lot of their resources. They've had a catastrophic illness, and they've put a lot of their money into those resources. Um, people have had to split assets. There's a way to, um, you know, I've, I've heard some stories about people who've been married for years and years, and they thought, you know, people, someone had given them information, well, maybe it'd be easier if you got divorced, and then you don't have to, you know, it's just because of the money and what you'll qualify for. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, that's kind of crazy information. You can split your assets so that you protect you, what you need, and you can protect your spouse so they can stay in their home, if that were to ever be an option. Um, and it's not the same in every, uh, every state is a little bit different how they run their Medicaid program. Um, the Medicaid program in nursing homes would pretty much be the same anywhere because nursing homes are federally regulated. And like I said, assisted livings are regulated by the state. So that makes it a little bit different. Extra help, I just always mention extra help because again of the Medicare prescription drug programs that are out there. Um, and Social Security, and if you may qualify for a little bit extra help um, with your low-income subsidy, that might be an option for folks that they don't realize that they have. Um, do you like Chubby Checker dancing? You have to love that picture um, for, for your prescription costs. And prescription, you know, prescription costs alone, um, a lot of times we'll get calls and we talk to people who are, you know, I don't know if I should eat and I don't know if I should buy my medication. That's how much my medication costs. It's just amazing um, how certain things, uh, medication costs can come you know, up to $1,000 a month. If you're on any kind of chemo, if you're on any kind of, uh, um, you know, any kind of therapies that Medicare doesn't cover, your costs can be so, so high. So it's good to know what your options are. And there are people who fall into the gap. Um, there are ways to appeal if you're denied any type of service. This happens when people are in therapy and Medicare is not going to cover your therapy anymore, per se. Um, again, I mentioned that when, when you're in a nursing home and you're getting therapy or your loved one's getting therapy, it may be that you were given an option to have up to 100 days, but if you're not progressing with therapy, they may only have you on therapy for 21 days. Um, and then you have to make a choice. Am I gonna be able to stay here and pay? Or am I able to go home? Or maybe not, maybe I shouldn't go home anymore. Maybe I should look to a senior housing. Maybe I should look to an assisted living and see what my options are. Um, there are all different types of assistance programs that are out there. Um, some of the drug companies have sample programs. You can get assistance directly from the RX company that does that medication that you need. Um, there's MedAssist in the county that will offer some, some assistance at times. A lot of them are based on, on income. A lot of them are based on sometimes need. It's not income at all. Uh, it's just a, a different option that's out there for people. And we, when we talk to folks, and I know that our ship counselors talk about all the different resources that are available to people based on what you need or what your loved one needs, um, because it's so many options that are available. A lot of times we talk to folks too that um, don't realize that they're eligible for potential VA benefits. Now it may take you a year to get those benefits. Once you put in an application, it takes a very long time but a spouse of someone who was in service might still be able to get some benefits as well that they weren't sure that they could get. So we like to mention that at times because it just, it's just an extra piece of information. I always talk about this a little bit um, because when I'm working with folks a lot of times and I work with families all the time, I always say nothing beats an alert and competent person. A lot of times we know that we have to live with the choices that we make, right? And sometimes we don't make all the best choices. And that happens sometimes with folks when you're looking at long-term care service. Um, I can't tell you how many times I talk to residents in facilities and they'll say, my children put me here. Not that I couldn't live in my house safely anymore, my house was condemned, but my children put me here. Well, your children care about you, so I'm sure they want you to be safe. And I'm sure that there was a lot of good reasons for that. When you are trying to make plans, and it's like anything else, healthcare is one of those same things, and it includes all the different levels. And I know Susan's had a lot of folks here to talk about decision making, 
um, a doctor to talk about preparing and planning, and you can't stress that enough. Healthcare is like anything else. Have conversations with your family member. What do you want to have happen? You know, if this is gonna happen, mom, do you wanna live with me? Do you want me to have a room in my house where you are? Do you want um, to look at senior housing? Do you think that might be an option? Um, have we ever talked about advanced directives? Have we ever talked about those things as far as pre-planning is concerned? Um, including the person in the decisions when and if possible is absolutely always the best. Um, there are times, of course, when people who have any type of dementia are not as able to participate in those decisions, but if you've had those conversations over the years and you, and you try to be, um, I always say try to be the bigger person, bring up the conversation, always talk about it, you know, not just maybe at the Christmas table, but when you're talking to folks, have you ever thought about this? It's really, really important to have all of those different things laid out. Um, planning ahead is definitely crucial. If um, you've made someone your power of attorney or your healthcare power of attorney, tell them that they're your power of attorney because sometimes people don't know or they've locked the documents up in a place where they've not told anybody where the documents are. Um, so be very, very clear about what your directives are. Um, one of the folks that I work with in the community a lot, um, I just love how he, I don't know what he did in his life, but he is so attuned to all of his decision making. And he went in to have, um, I think his second knee replacement, and Kelly knows him. Um, and I love, he's, he's a person that used to work for the Council on Aging. He still volunteers in a lot of different capacities, but he was so good about saying, you know, if this happens, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go in for my surgery. I'm gonna stay in the facility 14 days because that's what I wanna do. And I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna have this person bring me my meals. I'm gonna have this home health. And he would email me all his little ideas of what he was gonna do. And I said, well, at least he's thinking about all of that. Good for him. Um, having a plan. And he's a person who doesn't, he's not married, he doesn't have any children in this country, and he knows that he needs assistance, even though he's very, very independent. So like I said, planning ahead is definitely crucial, and telling those folks that are part of that decision making. Uh, navigators old and new. Um, like I said, there's a lot of information that you can get from, say, your Department of Social Services in your county. Um, just one call was that number I gave you. That's the information and assistance in Mecklenburg County. Anybody can call it. There's no, you know, no question that's inappropriate because, like I said, it's a huge system to navigate, and it's very, very. Uh, if you've never, even if you've worked in it, it's confusing for the people who have worked in it for years. So we can't expect you to know everything. And a lot of times when I get calls from folks, they'll say, you know, I never thought about these types of things. I never thought about what I needed to do to pre-plan or what I needed to do to think, to talk to my mom about. And I'm, you know, I'm a smart person. I work in the banking industry and I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm like, you know, it's okay because I absolutely don't know what you do, but I know this and let me try to help you get through it. An ombudsman. Ombudsmen are free and confidential, and that's me. I can help you choose and look at um, options for you to either stay home with services, or if you're looking at long-term care facilities, I can help you kind of navigate the choices that you have and what you might need. Um, like I said, senior health information, uh, insurance information programs, your SHIP counselors, they're a huge resource of information for you. Um, you have to give a call out to your parish nurse programs because I know Susan's a wealth of information and can help you get started in the right direction. Um, huh? And Mary, there's Mary. Mary's from Covenant and Mary Amadiachi's back there. How long have you been at Covenant now as the parish nurse? Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you for coming. Um, so there's a lot of wealth of information in the parish nurse programs that are out there and they can help get connected to ser um, service. And sometimes um, one of the uh, ladies that I work with, there's a very large volunteer organization through um, Jewish Family Services and the folks that they visit in facilities. There's all wealth of information out there. It's just amazing, uh, the folks that have their hands um, in the volunteer aspects of all of the different choices that you have. Paid opportunities, which are always a good option for folks. I will always recommend different case managers or different um, financial planners, especially to folks whose family lives here, whose parents live here, and they're making choices and they live out of state. And they just need an extra set of eyes, an extra person to help navigate that. Um, maybe somebody who can kind of say, look, um, here are your options and I can be your eyes here and I can go out and look at all the different services with you. Um, I can you know, make you feel more comfortable about the choices that you have. So that is a definitely, a very good paid option for folks. You may use them for once, one or two times to get um, ideas about where to go, or you might have a case manager who actually um, has the opportunity 
uh, to follow somebody who's in a facility. I've had a lot of folks over the years that have had somebody, they just come once a month and visit them if they're in a long-term care setting, just to see how things are. Uh, and that works out really, really well. Elder care attorneys to get your documents in order. Um, and financial planners, like I said, and some of the newer things that are happening, like I said, there's a lot of health navigators out there is what they're calling them. Um, right now, our health navigator has been designated in Mecklenburg County as um, uh, legal services of the Southern Piedmont, which is our legal aid program. And they are considered health navigators. There are transition coordinators emerging in lots of different areas and hospitals and different programs. And of course, your, your benefits and options counselors, which are very, very similar to some of your SHIP uh, counselors in the community. And who keeps track of all this information, right? That's the hardest part. There's usually not one person that knows everything. And as the person who might be needing the service, it's very, very overwhelming. Um, so you have all these different things that you need to think about. Um, if I'm at home, what are the things that I need? Usually folks don't have one doctor anymore. They have a primary care doctor. They may have a specialist or two or three. Um, doctor's office visits and if I ever need to go to a rehab center. So all those things are very, very important. And there's a lot of burden on that person, which is why we need so much help. Um, there's a lot of different programs out there. Uh, there's a lot of things for folks who are even in their homes um, as far as med reminder programs and things that, that home health agencies provide and have for a long time. There's, um, with technology being so wonderful like it is today, there's a lot of opportunity for people to do some self-monitoring at home. Um, there's different programs where you can have a blood pressure monitor and it goes right to your doctor's office. I mean, there's amazing things that are kind of coming down the pike for people to be able to stay in their home or, or to get information um, to their doctor's office and to their specialists, um, maybe not without going and doing the actual office visit as much. Um, there's lots of different uh, services out there and, and things that can kind of help people stay in their home if that's what they want to do. But it is a confusing endeavor and we always need help. So this is just a, a list of some of the resources for all the different things that I sort of in a roundabout way mentioned. Um, like I said, there's an Area Agency on Aging in every state. So the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging is just kind of a very general website, has a lot of information and resources on it. Um, instead of, if you don't wanna write all this down, you can grab one of my packets in the back. It has everything on there for you. Um, the Division of Health and Human Services actually has listings of all of the facilities. So if you wanted to look up all of the assisted livings in a certain county, that would have a list for you. Um, I mentioned the star rating system. If you're looking up um, a lot of times for nursing home and, and home health compare, you can look at medicare.gov. It'll give you a star rating system for nursing homes. One of the things that I always do say, just as a caveat, any type, any type of Googling information that you're doing, um, you know, look at a couple different sources. Medicare.gov is going to be your best source for nursing homes, but there's a lot of sources out there um, that might be opinion based. It's good information posted by families, but it, you know, it may scare you a little bit sometimes. Uh, it may not be a, a government site, it may not be a regulated site, to be very honest with you. Um, but one of the things that I always tell folks about that when you're choosing any type of setting, whether it be an apartment setting or whether it be a nursing home, go and visit, go unannounced, talk to people that live there, find families that live there. Um, look at the star rating, if it's a nursing home or assisted living, that's one piece, but do lots of, of inquiry and do lots of visits. Sometimes it's not just the pretty shiny place that looks really, really good, but when you go into a smaller facility, sometimes it just feels right to you. Um, and it might be a really good option for you. It's a building that might be 40 years old, but it's just the people smiling and the way things are handled that make you feel really good about it. Um, and you know, all of those types of things just go with your gut instinct on those. Um, there's assisted living um, kind of consumer alliance information that gives you some information about how to choose assisted livings if that's an option. Um, and the you know, Senior Health Insurance Information Program is under the um, Department of Insurance, and so that's always a good uh, website to have as well. Let me see what else I have in here. Oops, that's probably about it. Um, I think I just talked, well, you know, I've been talking for almost an hour. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Um, and I, I can tend to talk and, and babble pretty um, at nauseum, so I'm so sorry to do that. 
Uh, this is my contact information for what I do with the Ombudsman program, but I went through a whole lot of information. Um, the things that I want to make sure, like I said, it's just a huge system to navigate, ask lots of questions. Um, I think there's lots of way to work the system and people that have been in it for a while can give you lots of good information too. I will always tell folks when I get those panic calls on Friday afternoon uh, about maybe a loved one's been in the hospital for a couple days and they didn't really give the family good warning. Um, you know, we gotta move mom today, we gotta move mom today. No, you don't. Say no. I don't have a place that I'm ready to move mom. I haven't looked at it, it's not gonna happen. It's okay to do that. It's okay to say that I'm not, um, I'm sorry, did I? I said, if you're in a hospital and you're feeling or you're being pressured to make a choice for somebody about moving out um, of that hospital before you've had an option to look at those places yourself or make a phone call, you can actually say, I'm not quite ready to do that. Um, I'm not going to have that happen. I have folks that live in nursing facilities, same, same instance. I'll have folks that live in facilities that will say, um, my 20 days of Medicare are up. Um, they told me that I have to move out. And I'm not ready to have my husband come home with me, but I have no option. Yes, you do. That's not appropriate. If you're not going to have someone be safe in the home, they haven't made accommodations for you to get equipment in your home or home health or anything like that, you have options. You've got to ask lots of questions, and there's a lot of community resources out there with those particular instances that would be me, but Department of Social Services, too, would get involved in all of those types of things. Know what, know what resources that you have around you and be prepared to answer some of those questions and ask lots of questions. Uh, if it doesn't feel right to you, it probably isn't right. There's lots of options out there. In, like anything, like any other setting where you would live, nursing home, assisted living, there's a process of eviction that has to happen in all of these places. Um, it can't just be a one-day notice. Um, in any pretty, pretty much setting you have, it's a 30-day notice, and it is in the nursing home as well. Uh, so it's just, it, that's a call that I get a lot. I have to make a choice real, real fast, and we'll kind of back off and try to help folks make a better choice so that they're prepared. Does anybody have any questions about anything? I gave you a whole lot of information, so I'm happy to take questions. Hillary? Hil yeah, two L's. Yep, like Hillary Clinton. You're going to remember that better. Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> K-A-Y-L-O-R, yes, ma'am. I ombudsman, yes. Yes, ma'am. Assisted livings, like move entirely? Well, that's a really interesting question. I would say the number's quite high. Um, I don't know if people track it. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I would say many, many years ago it might have been a different answer. I know a lot of residents that have lived in assisted livings for 10 or years or more and they've never changed. Um, it doesn't mean that the name and the company hasn't changed around them four or five times, um, which may make a change for them. Um, a lot of people do move into a location and it just isn't what they thought it would be. Um, or they move into a location because they had a room ready, but they really were waiting for that place in Mint Hill to open up near their children. So a lot of times people do move and they move pretty quickly. Um, so I don't know if anyone's ever tracked it. That'd be a really fascinating question. Um, I will say I see a lot of people who facility hop in all different aspects. And so I've seen people that have done that. Yeah, Marie. Respite care, as far as in like assisted living and nursing homes, um, there, is, there are a lot of respite care options for folks and people don't really know it exists sometimes, um, especially in assisted living. Nursing homes don't do it quite as much as they used to, but you can be uh, caregiving for a loved one or a spouse and you want to take that vacation that you haven't been able to take or go visit your children or someone's getting married. And assisted livings do a daily rate or a weekly rate at times so that you can have someone go and stay for a short period of time. Um, sometimes people find it cheaper to pay for the whole month, to be honest with you, <laughs> than pay the, the daily rate, and they only stay for a week or 10 days, and that is an option for people. Uh, you have to, like anything else, to get into an assisted living in a nursing home, you have to 
um, have a, a form filled out by your doctor to say that you're needing that level of care. And once that's happened, uh, you're able to kind of pursue the admission process to get into any of those buildings. So it's a good point. Yes? Housing vouchers. I'm sort of familiar too. Um, housing vouchers are given uh, and uh, as need, it's a, um, there's a very long waiting list for income-based housing vouchers, which are called Section 8 vouchers. And some senior apartments accept those vouchers. Um, some are mostly, uh, there's a lot of, um, maybe some of those high rises people are familiar with downtown, like Edwin Towers and Hall House. Those, a lot of folks in those buildings have Section 8 vouchers. Um, but even some of the very nice facilities out there, um, the um, Pineville, uh, Pineville has the Dorchester and the Manor. They have some Section 8 vouchers out there for people who are, have um, uh, income-based um, issues. And it's hard to get them. Um, but uh, you, you, know, you have to apply through Charlotte Housing Authority, um, and it's based on a waiting list, and it's based on your income requirements, but they are out there and they are available, and it's always worth getting your name on a list. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yeah, the backwards number. Just One Call is uh, through Department of Social Services, and it is the information and assistance line for Mecklenburg County, and it is, it's that 704-432-1111. Um, you can call and any day during the week between 8.30 and 5.30, you'll get a social worker who will answer the phone. I, I, and they probably wanna single-handedly make me stop talking because I never call the main number for DSS ever. I always call just one call because I get a human. Um, and if <laughs> I get a human, that makes a lot of sense, Hill. Um, but you can get someone, you can say, I need this list. Um, this doesn't seem quite right to me. <clears throat> Haven't seen my neighbor in three days and no one will come to the door and I need adult protective services. Um, something is just, you know, I just need a general information to something very severe and they will handle all of those things. I need to know if, um, you know, I've had people use them because they'll attach information as far as like a food pantry that's available or I might need um, intake for an adult social worker at, at um, you know, Department of Social Services to work with, a, um, maybe they're referring a neighbor who needs some assistance. They actually have adult social services will do intake and they will do case management, which a lot of people don't realize that they do. Um, but you can say, this person really doesn't have anybody, their family's not from here. Um, is there any way you can do a preventative outreach visit? And they can do that as well. Does that help answer it? Just a lot of good questions to ask and there's no Dumb questions. Yes? Is there a section called Recognize Your Dad? No, there's not. But um, in the magazine back there, the All About Seniors magazine, um, every Department of Social Services in all the counties have an intake, which is an information and assistance line. So every Department of Social Services had it. Um, just one call is a little bit different in Mecklenburg because they actually have the social workers that are staffing those calls. But there is something like that. And they should have a good good handle on the information for Gaston County as well. Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. Um, in general, Union County has a super strong Council on Aging. Um, the Area Agency on Aging, which is my agency, is a regional organization and we manage nine counties. And so we're kind of the parent company to all of the different counties that we serve. So we actually monitor the services that a Council on Aging would provide in all of the counties we serve. So we serve Mecklenburg County and all the contingent counties. We serve nine total. Um, a Council on Aging, all of our counties except Mecklenburg have a Council on Aging. Union Counties is very strong. Iredale Counties is very strong as well. Our Council on Aging here in Mecklenburg actually kind of went dormant last year. Um, they did not provide any service, so to speak. They did not actually provide, say, respite care or a service. They provided advocacy and education, and that was funded primarily by the city. And when we had some budget restraints the past couple years, their money that they were given to operate lowered and lowered and lowered every year. So it actually just went defunct, to make sense. Um, and most every county has Council on Aging. Like I said, Mecklenburg's a little bit different, but most of them do provide service. So for example, the Council on Aging in Union County 
um, provides the family caregiver support program here, Department of Social Services does it. So the service is the same in the county, it's just provided by a different entity. Does that help answer that? Right. The direct services that we do, the ombudsman are a direct service in every county, and there's five of us. So I do Mecklenburg County. Um, the, the girl, Lori, who does Union County, she does Cabarrus Union and Anson, so we divide it up um, among all nine of our counties. Uh, we also provide um, a senior workforce program, which is a direct service that for educating and getting people up to speed with senior work programs if they're going back to school later in life. Um, we are the monitoring agent for how the county spends their dollars. So I always say it's like laundering money for the mob. You have to love that analogy. The state gives us, as the AAA, all of the money, and based on population and need and age of person, we divide and give the money out to the counties. Mecklenburg gets this much for senior centers, senior nutrition programs, Union County gets this much to operate. So we just kind of, mon and so we go back in and do quality assurance monitoring to make sure they're spending their dollars the way they said they would. So our agency only has 15 people. I only work with 15 others in the area agency for all nine counties. So we just kind of help and handle and hold hands through processes. Good question. Any other questions? What'd you say? Oh, uh, no problem. It's a lot of information. Well, good, good. If there, like I said, I, I brought a lot of handouts. Please grab them as you go out. If there's anything you want to grab and share, please do that as well. Um, you've got a question. They are all listed under government agencies in that magazine. Just the, that actual, the All About Seniors covers 12 counties because they go into South Carolina in three of their counties, um, but it only covers a certain area. There are lots of different places to find the listings everywhere. All About Seniors is probably the best comprehensive guide that our region has um, because it lists, you know, government agencies, it lists elder law attorneys, home health, um, facility listings, so it's got a lot of good information that way. I think it's a little hard to navigate at first, you gotta get used to it. Uh, um, it's alphabetically at the top of the page, and then it's county specific when you look at the actual information. But it's probably the most comprehensive one we have. Yes, ma'am, that's okay. No, I would say, I mean, power of attorney, yes, but a social security? If you're, yeah, if you're already the power of attorney, why would you have to have another form, say? Yeah, yeah. That's kind of an interesting question. I haven't really, I mean, besides the basic, you know, how to, how to get a power of attorney on anyone, you know, and having permission from the person to be able to do it, because the only caveat of any power of attorney, even with Social Security, would be that person has to give you permission to access the information as a family member, as a, you know, child, you know, spouse, not, not with spouses, it's a little different, but with children. Um, but I haven't heard one specific, unless there's something new. A lot of the things with Social Security have changed in the past year or two because things have been more automated. Um, and so you can do things a little bit differently and you know, instead of getting your Social Security check, everything's direct now. So maybe it's a different piece they put in place to make sure there wasn't any fraudulent behavior. It's the only thing I can think of. I wish I had a better answer. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Sure. I mean, um, if it's looking at kind of if he's in the home right now and you're looking at all the different options, um, you know, I definitely already always tell folks to take the All About Seniors and look at it and see what all the options are and kind of have an idea. But you can always call our agency 
Um, we would be able to, whether it's our family caregiver that might start with you, and, and that's what I'm trying to think. Our agency has a family caregiver, and so does the family caregiver program. I actually have a flyer for that back at the table. That might be a good place to start, just to kind of overview. Um, there's two folks at our Department of Social Services that deal with that all day long, and they just might be able to get you started with some options. Um, if you're looking at long-term care as an option, um, I would definitely say ombudsman or call me. That would be a, a good thing that we could do. But just to get you started, probably family caregiver would be good. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, it's always kind of an interesting subject to present because it's not super exciting, but we try to make it as exciting as possible. Um, so I appreciate it. any information that I've given. If you want any copies of anything, I'm happy to give it to you. So thank you, Susan, for having me.